Hello, and welcome to Coffee with Crane. I'm Joseph Patrick. Every once in a while, we like to get together over a cup of our favorite morning beverage and talk with industry professionals, see what's going on in the world. Uh, recently, you've reached out and asked uh, what the current state of logistics as a whole is. Well, to help us get a better overview of the situation, I've asked Michael Abadie, Crane's VP of Global Lead Automotive and Industrial, to come on and talk with us today. How are you, Michael? I'm oh, great. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's uh, it's nice to, to talk to people, you know, uh, outside of this whole situation. Yeah, coffee with my clients is one of the things I miss more than anything else. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, jump right on in. Uh, how, how's that sound? Sounds great. All right. So overall, how would you characterize the state of the industry right now? You know, it's a great question. You know, I think one thing I'd like to do in answering that question, though, is just talk a little bit about the industry pre-virus. You know, obviously we, we can't characterize the virus as speed bump, but I think the industry was kind of on a trajectory long before it happened that I think really, really deserves a little bit of attention. And um, if we go to the pre-virus industry, I mean, what you saw were uh, most of the automakers reshaping to meet uh, new government standards and carbon emission and safety and matching consumer demand with, with what they're looking for in connected cars, different ownership models, um, and adapting to rapidly changing technology. You know, so what we really saw at that time, and I'm going back to the last quarter of uh, 2019, was significant capital investments in uh, electric vehicles, in autonomy, in rideshare. Um, and we did see some workforce reductions, and it was really uh, reshaping the industry around lower expectations for vehicle sales that were expected to cool off slightly this year anyways but primarily to reshape the industry for, for who we're going to be in the next five to 10 years. So that before COVID-19 hit, it was already affecting the, uh, things were already moving in the industry. Yeah. I mean, you'd see the last five years growing is that uh, every year was a record year. I mean, we've continued to make more and more vehicles and particularly in North America. Um, so this year wasn't really projected to be a down year, but we really did see demand slightly cooling um, and the industry shaping around that. So it was already uh, shifting, but how did COVID-19 uh, have an effect on that? How did that impact it? Yeah, well, the immediate impact um, was a hit to volume. A tremendous test of supply chains that we've never seen before in the history of the world. But I'll, I'll tell you, I think because of the nature of the way this virus came out, it was a really different exercise. Uh, this industry is very, very geographically dependent on the whole globe. So initially when it hit in China, we have a, a standard set of processes we go through to deal with this. So we went from a primary transportation to an expedited transportation to potentially even charters uh, until that became something that we couldn't do. You know, so it really tested supply chain a lot of different ways and made us recognize um, in supply chain, we see it every day. But I think these companies in whole got a recognition of how dependent they are on other geographies. Most of the auto companies have had the same view of globalization, um, the same view of supply chain and inventory management practices, but, but I do think we're gonna start to question uh, with just-in-time inventories, how much safety stock is the right amount? How much risk is an acceptable amount of, of risk? And we're gonna see some collaboration uh, much more between purchasing logistics and the underlying providers. How have you seen uh, technology being utilized in different ways uh, as far as these uh, logistical changes have gone? Well, as we're, we're starting to look right now, I mean, the new challenge is restarting the plants. And we've seen a, a China restart. Uh, so far, that's gone pretty well. Uh, Europe just actually had a couple plants start this week. And we had a couple in the south of the United States start. What we're seeing as a provider is a lot of our clients are using technology to kind of model what they're able to build or what the least impact to expedited transportation is to get these factories running at the lowest cost. I think in the past, that was something that was impossible or very difficult anyways. Well, I had a, a buddy uh, find out that I was gonna have you on the show today and he wanted to know uh, what EV autonomy is. And what is so what is that now? What do you feel about it? Well, I mean, it's, it's really a next step in the industry. So, um, you know, we're looking at a lot of people going away from uh, traditionally aspirated cars. So electric is, is the initial answer. If you're going to build a car with, without a gas engine, electric is the first choice. You know, and what we're really seeing is I think the industry had historically dabbled in it. There were a lot of government stimulus and a little, lot of different things that were helping drive that. 
but now you're starting to see governmental restrictions where they're looking at completely carbon neutral cities and a lot of these kind of things that's making it very important for the automakers and really the reshaping of the industry to be able to provide that kind of car. So it's kind of the, the next step in the evolution of uh, transit in a way. Yeah, so I mean, we live in the States and I think, you know, our adoption of that is gonna be a lot slower. But, but even if we get to a 10% adoption rate uh, over the next five to 10 years, you're still talking about a million and a half vehicles. Um, so so that's, that's a pretty, pretty big change. That's pretty significant, um, yeah. Yeah, and as we look at autonomy, I mean, I think, um, we've gradually had things introduced over time, right? Like backup beepers and sensors that would tell you when you're about to hit something. And the cars have gotten increasingly more complicated and help us make better decisions to stay in lanes and avoid collisions. You know, autonomy is available in very, very many different forms. I don't know what point we're gonna be fully autonomous, but what you're seeing is the shift to EV and the shift to autonomy is creating an entirely new ecosystem of suppliers. So what we're seeing on an inbound supply chain is starting to transition to something that looks a lot more like a tech sector supply chain. Um, instead of high volume and repetitive, it's very chaotic and meets immediate demand for the customers. On the way out, uh, consumer retail type supply chains where we're planning to send these vehicles directly to customers. We had a great experience at Crane. Uh, just there's another family company that specializes on kind of consumer facing retail focus. And as we're designing the model for some of these electric companies is they're helping design a methodology to deliver the cars, to manage the brand, uh, to even potentially install chargers in people's driveways. But it's a very, very big step change from the traditional dealer model and how a car gets out to people. Once a car does get to people, sales and service is now starting to look like e-fulfillment or potentially call centers. And again, this is a very particular focus of another area of the crane companies, Davico, that's helping us bring that to the auto industry. That's really fascinating. We're, we're really looking into the future here. We're, uh, we're seeing things shift and evolve. So uh, what do you think your clients should be uh, watching out for on the horizon? Gaze into your crystal ball for us. What, what should they be looking out for? <laughs> so my, my crystal ball, I mean, I, I think probably first and foremost are just the long-term impacts to the underlying carriers and the transportation network they rely on. There's been a traditional relationship between these companies and how we try to manage to keep costs down. But, but right now, I mean, there's very real possibilities of steamship lines or airlines going bankrupt. There's definite possibility of realignment of some of the vessel sharing agreements. Uh, the trucker shortage didn't go away. Um, it's still out there. Right. And as we return to demand, I think, Understanding what's going on in the underlying carriers is going to be really key. You know, what I would say probably first and foremost, even beyond that, is just as we look at what's gone on in government policy with the USMCA, with the trade dispute with China, with Brexit, I think there's a lot of focus that needs to be put into trade um, and supply chain agility. Within Crane, we've, we've done quite a bit between the auto sector and our, our trade compliance specialist to understand as these things change, what's the best opportunity to either gain some advantage or avoid negative consequence. But I think in the past in the auto industry, those were viewed as uh, invaluables. And right now they could potentially become an area of advantage for people that understand them. It's a pretty exciting time to be in the industry, right? It is. I think one of the CEOs here in Detroit famously said this industry has changed more in the last five years than it did in the first 50. Wow. Um, and I think that's only getting faster. I could see that. Well, Michael, thanks for, for stopping into Coffee with Crane. Sadly, that's all the time we have for the day, but thanks again for, for sharing your wisdom and insights with us. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I appreciate the visit. <laughs> you take care, all right? Stay safe. All right, see ya. Well, I'm gonna go freshen up my cup right now and tell you what, we'll see you again next time on Coffee with Crane.